This is on assignment. Hello and welcome to a special edition of On Assignment, coming to you from the U.S. State Department in Washington. I'm Alex Villarreal. And I'm Philip Alexio. John Kerry is the 68th U.S. Secretary of State. He's been a very busy man traveling around so far this year. And of course, when he's busy, that means everyone else in this building is very busy too. Today, we're going to talk to the head of state press office about what it's like to represent the nerve center of U.S. diplomacy to the media. We'll also be delving into some of the nation's foreign policy efforts with our VOA correspondents specializing in Egypt, Russia, and also in Iran. On Assignment is on assignment at the State Department. Don't go away. So a large part of what the State Department does is provide information to the press and the public about U.S. foreign affairs. Every day, State briefs reporters on the latest updates and also takes their questions. Jen Saki is the uh, department's lead spokeswoman, but uh, Patrick Ventrell is here. He's the director of the uh, press office. He, you've also spent quite a bit of time behind the podium yourself, and I always kind of wondered, what is it like? How do you really get that job? What kind of person does it take? Well, we're a mix of different people here at the State Department. I'm a career foreign service officer and I've served uh, at a number of uh, overseas uh, posts and embassies and at our mission uh, at the United Nations and as a spokesperson for uh, the U.S. government at a variety of embassies. And so uh, when I came back here to Washington a couple of years, I started uh, as the press office director and uh, we do coordinate every day to have nearly every single day of the working day of the year have uh, an interaction with the press, usually an on-camera briefing where we can hear from reporters around the world and, and answer their questions to the best of our ability. Now is it, a, is it, is it is each day a typical day because it seems if you're watching the State Department things can get pretty hairy uh, as you know we, we've had around here recently obviously. So do you tend to scramble back there behind closed doors to figure out what you're going to say and what kind of team does it take to present what you're going to say to the public? Well, we work very hard. Uh, we do, of course, have a daily routine, but no day is typical. There, there are many world issues that come up. Uh, of course, some of the hottest conflicts in the world, but reporters want to know about uh, U.S. policy all over the world. Um, and so we have a whole team of advisors who are working in our regional bureaus who are experts on uh, all sorts of issues. And they come and brief us over the period of two to three hours every day to get ready for the briefing. So it's a routine process, I'd say, in the sense that uh, we have uh, a regular schedule, we have a, uh, a set of briefings that we do every day to get ready, uh, but the topics can change dramatically, the issues can change dramatically, um, and it takes a long time to get ready and, and present on behalf of the U.S. government uh, the, the views of uh, not only this department, but, but the government more widely. Now it's interesting to watch, sometimes there are some pretty heated discussions that happen during the briefing. How do you handle that when you're standing up there? Uh, you have to stay calm and, and know that you're speaking on behalf of your government. You're not presenting personal views, you're presenting the, the consensus view of, of the department and the U.S. government. Uh, and I think reporters are, are uh, as you all are reporters, are, uh, uh, have a right and need to ask good and tough questions. And so we see that as part of the process. Even some of the most tense moments or, or most heated exchanges uh, are with colleagues. I, I consider all the journalists here who cover the State Department uh, colleagues, foreign affairs experts as well. Uh, and it's a chance for us to uh, exchange candid views and, and have a real good exchange. Finally, you know, it's very interesting, the format of the briefing. Uh, you really let reporters ask as many questions as they want. How does that speak to State's mission? You know, our, our mission is to engage on behalf of the American people. Uh, around the world and we take that responsibility seriously uh, and uh, while of course sometimes when you take hundreds of questions in a day uh, it may seem laborious but uh, quite the contrary it's an opportunity for us to be transparent to engage and and to defend the positions of the US government and we take that uh, transparency mission seriously and we take seriously uh, the opportunity to explain to uh, people around the world what our positions are Oftentimes there's confusion. You look at situations, uh, whether it's Egypt or other places, where people uh, may not have a clear understanding of what our views are. And so uh, sometimes you have to repeat the view over and over again, but uh, it's something that we take seriously. Patrick Brentrell, the uh, head of the uh State Department Press Office. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Patrick. All right, well, still to come, we talk with our correspondent in Cairo about Egyptians' growing animosity toward the United States. You're watching On Assignment.
When President Obama canceled his upcoming September summit in Moscow with Russian President Vladimir Putin, many saw that move as a major rebuke. Well, up to now, the U.S. and Russia have been cooperating on a range of issues, but there have been some disagreements, including that of Syria. Right. Now, at the start of his presidency, we all remember, President Obama made resetting relations with Russia a high priority. But as VOA's correspondent in Moscow, Jim Brooke, tells me, the dispute over Edward Snowden is just one sign that has changed. President Obama's decision to cancel this planned meeting with Putin, what does that do for this U.S.-Russia reset that's been in the works now for a few years? Well, the reset is basically over. Um, I think we're entering a phase of U.S.-Russia relations where the U.S., the, the Obama administration, is going to downgrade the Russian relationship to second-tier officials. It will be purely transactional. There's the feeling there is no such thing as goodwill with the Kremlin. If you want a deal, you sit down, you negotiate the price, you renegotiate the price, and you finally come to the price. Uh, don't look for goodwill from either side. And don't expect the President of the United States to be involved because he's got a thousand days left in the office. He's thinking of his legacy, and he doesn't want to waste time. He doesn't want to have meetings for meetings. And I think that's why the meeting was canceled yesterday, that there really was nothing substantive that was going to come out of it. Jim, how badly has this dispute over Edward Snowden damaged the U.S.-Russia relationship? Alex, really it is a straw that has broken the camel's back, I think. There were a long succession of uh, disagreements between uh, the Putin government and the White House, and, and this is the final straw, I think. You have to go back to Putin's banning uh, American parents from adopting Russian children back in January, and since then there have been a six series of bad incidents. What are some of the other tensions that we've been seeing? Well, they, last fall, uh, Putin kicked out USAID, just unilaterally ended the aid program, which had been working quite well in Russia for 20 years. Uh, they decided to pull out of the non Lugar nuclear threat uh, reduction program. They basically made it clear that two American democracy groups should leave NDI, National Democracy Institute and the International Republican Institute. And then there's been a very serious crackdown on human rights groups, anti-corruption groups inside Russia, coupled with putting the most since, most important opposition people on trial, um, some people going into exile. There's a real change in Russia since Vladimir Putin came back to the Kremlin in May of last year, a very change for the negative. And how do you think uh, Russians, just sort of the general population, how have they been receiving this shift? Are they aligned with Putin on this anti-U.S. front? Well, yes, Alex, Putin is really doing this to build up domestic support, to consolidate his uh, domestic base. And this base, in this case, would be rural, small towns, dependent on state television, not having access to the Internet. Now, about half the country has access to the Internet. And they're much more plugged into mainstream thinking, and they're not really going on board with this. You look at uh, approval ratings of the U.S., they really haven't gone down that much, uh, maybe 55 percent or something. But Putin is doing this to create a foreign enemy and to try to rally uh, his domestic support around him. And a lot of Russians that I speak to are embarrassed or just tune him out. What would it take to repair the relationship? Uh, if something horrible happened on uh, in the eastern part of Russia with their Chinese friends, all of a sudden uh, the Kremlin would rediscover their the utility of getting along with uh, Europe and the United States. Uh, but they they feel their backs are pretty well covered with the Chinese, so they don't have to uh, worry about that. Um, I think at some point Mr. Putin will leave office, but that could not be for 10 years. So let's not hold our breaths on that. Uh, in the White House, Democrat, Republican, I don't think it really matters. Uh, Putin is a man who was traumatized by the collapses of the Soviet Union and took it very much to heart and uh, does sincerely believe that the West is out to always check and to diminish uh, Russia. And he also keeps a grudge. If you go back to the year 2000 and look at the picture of the G8, He's the last man standing. He's the only leader in the G8 who is still the leader. So he will lecture President Obama about President Bush. Mm. And 
President Obama could say, hey, that's why I was elected. I don't like Bush either, but why are we wasting our time with this conversation? And our thanks again to VOA's correspondent in Moscow, Jim Brook. Now, Secretary Kerry has, of course, been working hard to repair the United States' rocky relationship with Russia. It's interesting, Phil, to note that he even compared that relationship to a game of hockey, saying that both he and the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, are hockey players themselves, and that in diplomacy, just as in hockey, there's bound to be the occasional collision. That's kind of a good point. Well, anyway, uh, we're going to be coming back. We are at the State Department mezzanine. Stick around. You're watching On Assignment. For decades, the United States' relationship with Egypt has been largely defined by the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, but also by the financial rewards the United States gives to Egypt for maintaining it. However, the current upheavals in the region appear to have changed that dynamic. Right, and our correspondent in Cairo is Elizabeth Arad, who of course has a front seat to all of this. So I talked to her to get some insights about the current state of the U.S.-Egypt relationship. Let's take a look. Elizabeth, how would you describe the current state now of the U.S.-Egypt relationship? It's really low. I think this is probably the lowest point in many, many, many years. Both sides blame the United States for its stance or lack of a stance on the events of the last month. And it had been pretty bad before then, too, but particularly it's so polarized now. In deeply divided Egypt, Islamists reject the military. The military demonizes the Islamists but the two are united in their anger toward the United States. Armed Forces Chief Abdel Fattah al-Sisi told the Washington Post that America turned its back on Egyptians, and they won't forget that. The general played on a common perception that the U.S. was slow to support the ouster of Islamist President Mohamed Morsi because it backs the Muslim Brotherhood. And there's a music video, you talk about demonizing Washington. There's a music video that's been circulating that essentially ridicules President Obama specifically. Has he become a target of this uh, anti-U.S. discontent? Absolutely. And it's funny because it, it's he's accused of, of being a terrorist and there are many sort of made-up photographs of him with a long beard and sort of Taliban-style dress. So he's considered a terrorist by the pro-military people as well as being accused of being, you know, a, just a firm backer of Israel. Israel has been the cornerstone of U.S.-Egyptian relations for decades. In exchange for recognizing the Jewish state in 1979, Egypt has received more than a billion dollars a year in aid, mainly to the military. But the U.S. faces a dilemma. Normally, Washington calls a military ouster of a freely elected president a coup. By law, aid must be cut off. But aid to Egypt has been great leverage for the U.S. and has helped keep Cairo a trusted ally. To be fair, I mean, I think people are very angry at Turkey. They're mad at, at Qatar. There are other peoples that are that are the focus of, of wrath, but it's turned very strongly. What's changed? Well, one of the main things is this huge economic boost from the Gulf countries, in particular Saudi Arabia. The $12 billion that was given by several Gulf nations early in, in July First of all, it was a great backing of the military, and of course, USAID had gone mainly to the military. So it wasn't that they really, you know, felt any any great loss by by if they wanted to, to diss the United States. They they've got all this other money coming in from from the Gulf. For you, being a a, a U.S. journalist uh, working for a U.S. organization, have you felt any of this anti-U.S. sentiment yourself? A little bit. Depends on the crowd. Actually, the pro-government people are stronger. The people in the Rabat protest, the pro-Morsi protest, they really go out of their way to say, we love America, it's just your government. And it seems you get the same phrasing by everybody. So it seems to be sort of talking points that are spread around the crowd that, you know, we welcome you here. Part of it is because there's such a media blackout by state-owned media on what's going on there that they're, they're trying to get their message out as best they can. So it's there, there certainly is dislike of, of Americans and, and was with another journalist when she misspoke and someone thought she was talking about America. She was actually asking about a kid's age. And she just went off and off and off. And, and it's a very passionate subject for many people right now. Mm. Yeah. And, and how has that affected your ability to do your job? Well, I mean, it's throughout this, you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, 
groups of people can turn very quickly into sort of an ugly mob. And you just have to be, you just have to be careful. What do you think it's going to take to repair this relationship between the U.S. and Egypt? It's hard to say. One analyst I spoke to just said, you know, it's just going to take time. And I think that's probably right. It's a rough patch in U.S.-Egyptian relations. Political analyst Qasem believes it will pass. I can see this is something that will be repaired, but over a few years, not at present. Already, U.S. officials are cycling through Cairo, trying to help and mend relations as best they can. But they're, they're in a bit of a bind, not being able to come down for various reasons and legal reasons that they can't actually take a strong stand. They know that all both parties have to reconcile. So to back one or the other really isn't productive. So in some ways, it's going to depend on Egypt reconciling, have a more inclusive political relationship, and then the U.S. can engage with both sides without being suspected by the others. All right, and again, that was our correspondent in Cairo, Elizabeth Arrett. Now, the State Department says any solution in Egypt will require both sides to make compromises, decisions that spokeswoman Jen Psaki says can only be made by Egyptians for Egyptians. Well, moving on now to Iran, where they've got a new president there, Hassan Rouhani, who is offering a new approach to politics as usual. He's making some fresh promises about reviving the nuclear talks with the West. Right. President Rouhani says Iran is ready for serious negotiations on its nuclear program. And this, of course, Phil, sets a much softer tone than we saw with his predecessor, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Satari Darakshesh is the deputy director of the Persian News Network here at The Voice of America. And uh, I talked with her about Rouhani's presidency, and we talked about what his presidency might mean for U.S.-Iran relations. Let's take a look. Well, let's talk about the tactics. We know that as far as Iran principles and strategic principles, that's not going to change. Mr. Rouhani is as establishment as you can get. But as far as tactics, from what we see from the very first press conference that he had, he is focusing on engagement. He's focusing on resolving these matters through negotiations. So we know that he's serious. But also, let's not forget that in the last 15 years, Iran has had, has pursued many different negotiating tactics from uh, enriching uni uranium to 20 percent uh, to off and on with suspending uranium to a full opposition uh, to stopping uranium enrichment. So the approach is going to change, the tactics might change, but the principle remains the same. Iran would like to reserve the right of nuclear uh, enrichment. Iran has really taken a big hit with mm -hmm. the sanctions, but is it fair to say that he's an insider and that he could move things forward as opposed to where they're continuing to drag on and on? Well, it depends on many factors. One of them, how much maneuver room the Grand Ayatollah, Ayatollah Khamenei, is going to leave for him. How is he going to deal with, there are no political parties in Iran, but at least there are factions, the faction that lost the elections, and that's the powerful and influential IRGC. Uh, the Revolutionary Guards, they control pretty much every sector of the Iranian industries and oil and gas and so forth. How is he going to deal with them, whether he's going to make concessions? We have seen that he's made some concessions in the parliament by picking some of the cabinet members who are part or members of the IRGC. So there are different factors. We'll see how he's going to maneuver, whether he's going to be able to do it or not, again, it depends on the Grand Ayatollah. But there are other factors outside also that would um, influence and, his and, actions. And, and how much of an influence is Israel having on, on what is going on with Iran and their nuclear program? Because they have threatened to strike at some point, and of course, Iran maintains that it's for peaceful purposes. And of course, the U.S. wants to work something out along with the P5 nations. Well, uh, the, President Obama is also under pressure from Congress in this country. It's not only from right. Israel, because we know that there are members of Congress who would like to increase sanctions. And there is uh, actually legislation that are going to go through. And in September, there are going to be more debate on that that will stop the oil imports from um, Iran in 2014, which is going to be extremely biting uh, for Iran. Iran's uh, oil revenue that is their bloodline. Israel is a very, very close ally of the United States. Uh, we have, uh, the, 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 the country has this, this president, President Obama's support. Um, 
again, it depends on so many different factors. It depends on the Israeli-Palestinian peace. It depends on how Iran is going to operate its, uh, um, its members of the Hezbollah in Lebanon. Um, but the principle is going to remain the same. Again, the approach is different. Um, the President Obama has talked to the Israelis to sort of calm them down a little bit. And this is the room that uh, Netanyahu gave also to President Obama, Obama not to um, increase this rhetoric of war. It remains to be seen. Summertime is winding down, and in Washington, that means it's relatively quiet here on our streets compared to what we're used to. Now, part of the reason for that is that Congress is in recess right now, so we're left without the partisan back and forth that we're used to seeing. That's right. So when the Democrats or the donkeys move out, or when the Republicans, also known as the elephants, move out of town, that makes room for goats, and we're talking about real goats. Well, a herd of these munching machines, Alex, was set loose recently in the historical Congressional Cemetery to clean up a nagging problem. For that story, we go to BOA's Roseanne Skirbel. The ghosts came to eat. And they didn't lose any time, says handler Brian Knox, who owns a company called Eco Goats. They'll eat till midnight, so, and they'll get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and have something else to eat, too. The historic Congressional Cemetery dates to 1807. While it's not officially connected to Congress, the graveyard is the final resting place for some 200 congressmen and their families. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, composer John Philip Sousa, and even a circus performer who was killed by a tiger when in town. The goats are here to remove the overgrown thicket that blocks a view of the Anacostia River on one end of the property, says Paul Williams, president of the Association for the Preservation of the Historic Congressional Cemetery. We brought in the goats because um, we have an invasive species problem in our wooded area, not in our burial area, um, but those vines tend to kill the big mature trees and in turn the trees fall onto our historic headstones. William says that goats are a more ecologically friendly alternative to removing the vines by hand cutting, chemicals, or heavy equipment. Hey, goat! <laughs> Woo! Come on! Knox has 60 goats on the job. So the perfect place to put a goat is where you don't have anything you want to save. And uh, because they, you know, they're, they're pretty indiscriminate. They, I, I refer to them as herbicide with legs. <laughs> The animals are confined behind electric and chain link fences to keep them off the actual burial ground, which is neatly mowed. Hello. Paul Williams says while the goats aggressively consume the vegetation nonstop, they are also attracting visitors to the historic landmark. It really is bringing people. We, we're kind of treating it as an educational program as well to bring people into this beautiful cemetery. Holly Howell lives nearby and raced over with sons Quitten, Hollis, and Harrison to watch the goats at work. It's not something I'd heard of, so it was a great experiment, and I, I, I guess it's tried and true. They know what they're doing. My mom came into my room early this morning and started screaming, the goats, the goats, let's go see the goats. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, she made us run all the way over here, and it's, it's actually really cool. Just the fact that, you know, we don't have to use a bunch of chemicals and stuff to, uh, that'll um, hurt the environment. Uh, we can just use a, a nice uh, animal solution. <laughs> and they're eating everything. I didn't know the, what they were eating at first, so I was kind of interested in that too. Brian Knox expects the eco goats to clear the nearly one hectare plot in about a week. By the time Congress gets back in town, they will be long gone and on to another job. Roseanne Skirbel, VOA News, Washington. And that does it for this special edition of On Assignment here at the U.S. Department of State. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this inside look at the place responsible for maintaining the international relationships of the United States. Join us again next week when we return to our studios at VOA headquarters. And until then, be sure to check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and of course on VOANews.com. We'll see you next time.